Hello, friends. How's it going? I hope everyone is doing well. Hello. I'm of the sex, welcoming you back to Dubster Dive. The, I guess, unscripted show where I ramble on about an anime for who knows how long, and we have some laughs, we have some cries, and it involves me doing a lot of bitching and ranting if a show sucks. Hence the pun, Dubster. It's like we're dumped Dubster. Uh, but in all seriousness, um, I think we've already up to episode 24 of this thing. I can't believe it. Well, for the last, that same month, with a couple breaks here or there, we've looked at video game to anime adaptations and a couple of visual novel to anime adaptations with very middling results. But now, it is time to take a look at what is, to this day, my definitive favorite visual novel of all time. Diezire. Amentes Amantes. So what is Diezire? Well, combine Hellsing Ultimate with Fate's Day Night with a little bit of Bleach and a little bit of Soul Eater. I know you're all confused. Like, does that work? If you put them all in a blender and put it into a visual novel format? Yes. Yes, it does. Surprisingly well, in fact. Today, though, unfortunately, we're covering its anime adaptation, which, uh... Boo, it's gonna be fun. Right, so, do you want to hear about the war against the Nazi demons and their equivalent of Bon Kais, as well as the Battle Royale motivations that drive them? Stick around. But first, a little history. Let's go all the way back to the early 2000s, with a young studio named Light. They had just hired a man named Takashi Masata, who would put out his first visual novel in 2004 known as Paradise Lost, which received average reviews from everything I could tell. Again, this one does not have an official translation as of yet. There's a couple of fan translations out there, but nothing complete to my knowledge, so... Either way, this game, let's just say, was a rough draft, or I don't know what you call it, a thesis, for what was to come. In 2007, Masato would release what many to consider to be his masterpiece, the Ezire, which would receive numerous updates, adding new routes, new side stories, a PSP port, an HD remastered port on Steam, it got a lot of shit. It even got its own sequel called Kajiri Kamui Kagura. Yeah, trust me, I, I know. I, I don't get the name either. But moving on from that, it was in 2015 when both Diezire and Kamui had already received a decent amount of notoriety amongst the visual novel fandom, would get not one, but two crowdfunding campaigns. The first one being for an English localization version of Diezire, which was successful. In fact, it obliterated some of its stretch goals. It would launch on Steam in 2017, and it also had a promised Vita version that to this day has never come out, and there are still fans, like myself, hopelessly waiting for one to appear. It should be noted Diazire also got a Switch port. I don't understand why they don't just say screw it and give that one the English treatment instead. Look, as much as I'd love the Vita to get another visual novel, let's be honest, Diazire would reach a lot more people on the more popular system, and it's kind of what I want in the long run here. Anyway, but also in 2015, there was another crowdfunding project as stated before. This one for an anime adaptation. The anime adaptation would receive 17 episodes if they could raise 30 million yen. They raised almost 97 million yen, completely destroying expectations. Shoot, pop up. Shoot. <laughs> Told you these were unscripted. Anyway, so you might be thinking to yourself, okay, 30 million yen for 17, that means. 90 to 97 million must have given us a lot of episodes extra, right? Nope. 
they gave us one additional episode. And that one additional episode would ultimately lead to potentially the downfall of this whole anime for a lot of first-time viewers. Kind of ironic, in a sense. We'll get to that in a minute, though. So, the anime would be um, produced by Genko, people who've been in the anime industry since the late 90s, a studio that is known for working with JC staff, amongst others. The studio they handed this off to, though, was a studio called um, ACGT? Yeah, Dragon Ball GT! The studio behind Kino's Journey and Freezing. So they've at least done a few things. And a bunch of other stuff I didn't recognize off the top of my head, because you know, I'm an idiot, I guess. The first 12 episodes of Diazire would run from October to December of 2017, with the final six being aired as online OVAs, I suppose, in July 2018, with an English dub being greenlit by Faname Shion. Our best friends, they just won't leave us alone, will they? They're always going to be here for us. <laughs> so, I guess it's about time to get to the plot of what Diazire actually is. And this is going to be a long, long setup, but bear with me. I'm using the game setup, not the animes. Which, at this point, if you've been following visual novel adaptations, it's kind of obvious as to why. So, the game opens in May 1st, 1945, Berlin. The end of World War II. Berlin is falling, and the Soviets are occupying the city, killing the Nazis left and right, etc., etc., right? Well, come to find out, some of the Nazis were delving into the occult. Which bared some fruit. You see, um, some of the Nazis were given demonic powers. Thirteen of these, to be exact. And they formed what is known as the Longinus Dreisen Odin, or the Obsidian Round Table. I guess both names work, really. The problem is, these demons would get stronger with each and every soul they consumed. And because of their power hungriness, they didn't give a damn who they killed, be it friend or foe. Thus, the Nazis still lost the war. If anything, the LDO, for short, actually counted on it. They used Berlin as a sacrifice site to enact their ritual to give their leader, a man named Reinhard Heydrich, the abilities of a deity. You see, if the ritual was completed successfully and enough sacrifices were made, Heydrich would get the abilities of a god and be able to shape the world he wanted, an eternal Valhalla where war would never end. Unfortunately, though, it wasn't to be. You see, I guess the sacrifices just weren't enough. Thus, Heydrich and the other four top members of the Longinus Dreisen Orden were forced to depart and a castle made of the bones of their fallen victims into an alternate dimension for the failure of the ritual, while the remaining eight LDO members had to disperse until preparations could be made to form a second Berlin in order to enact the ritual once again, and this time not only bring their five leaders back, but also hopefully give their leader Hydric the abilities he so desired. We now flash forward to 2006, or present day at the time of the visual novel's release, where we follow Ren Fuji, as he now is beating the shit out of his best friend Shiro. Yeah, they're getting into a heavy fist fight, and the fight was so bad, both of them ended up in the hospital. After being discharged, Ren is now trying to move on with his life without his best friend for the stupid fight that they had started. It's explained why the fight started. I guess you could say Shiro's kind of a dick. Again, I'll get more on that later. Either way, it just so happens that Ren's peaceful days are about to come to an abrupt end. You see, the city he's in, which by the way is in Japan, if you couldn't tell by the names of Ren and Shiro, has been chosen by the LDO to be the second Berlin. So the eight remaining LDO members have come here to enact the ritual. But the way the ritual works, in order to bring back their five masters, they must have battles at eight separate points around the city, be it a tower, 
be it a park, etc. You see, these eight points form the shape of a swastika around the city. And the battles must be fought amongst strong opponents for the sacrifice to count. You can't just have a rando be the sacrifice. It has to be someone who is incredibly powerful. Which is where the incentive system comes in for the Nazis to, in fact, betray each other. You see, Heydrich promised that if he were to return, he would use his abilities to grant the owners of the eight swastika points each one wish. So, you can see where this is going. There is eight Nazis, a few protagonists that will get the abilities to fight said Nazis, and eight swastika points. Not enough to go around for all eight Nazis to get one. Let's just leave it at that. So there's plenty of backstabbing, traitors on each other, etc. And where does Ren fall into this? Well, it just so happens, due to redacted spoiler reasons, he also has magical powers of his own that he awakens to, and the Nazis must train him, reluctantly so. That way he can become a more powerful opponent in order to be a worthy sacrifice for one of the Slashtika points. That's just the basic setup for DA Zire. I know that's a lot to break down, but trust me, I fucking love this game. I really do. In fact, it goes into a lot of moral questions as well, not just the typical over-the-top fights between some of the super-powered demons, which, by the way, those fights are awesome. But it asks questions such as, would you sacrifice the lives of several thousand strangers in order to resurrect the one person you love most in this world? On top of that, it also puts the protagonist, Ren, in a position of grandstanding morality where he's preaching to someone, only to be then put in that exact same position a few hours later and then understand where that person was coming from he was preaching to and realizing, oh shit, I didn't think of things from their point of view before, I feel like a dick now. And understanding how that person could actually have ended up so screwed up. Again, the game is incredibly well written. But, we're not here to talk about the game. Oh boy. We're here to talk about its anime adaptation. So, as stated, its anime adaptation got one additional episode. This additional episode is called Verfo Lensengen, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And it serves as a prequel to everything in the formation of the LDO. It makes sense to start here, the, in theory. The problem is... No, it doesn't work. You see, you unlock this prequel side story about 40 to 50 hours into the VN, give or take. It's after you finish two of the routes. I should mention, the game works on a root system order where they all take place in order so you do heroin one two three four in that order and if you do them out of order you'll be completely lost this is only an issue in the steam version with the way it's set up i heard other versions that came out over in japan do not have this issue and force you to play them in the correct order i have no idea how steam screwed this up so badly i don't know who is to blame here but whatever point is the anime starts with a story that you're not supposed to get until after finishing the first two heroin routes. So you're supposed to know who these characters are, why they're forming the LDO, and what led them down this path already. This is meant to be a sort of, I guess, origin story for some of the villains. In the anime, though, as it being the first impressions for a lot of people that don't know DZ Ray, it's a confusing mess. You are constantly shown characters, you have no idea who they are. If you start an anime being thrown 10 to 13 characters without giving any context as to who's who is not a good way to tell your story. Not to mention, it's an abridged version of that side story. How? The side story's not even that long. <sighs> uh, only things got better from here. So that prologue I talked about, which should have been the first episode earlier about Berlin, 
is cut down to two minutes or so at the end of this side story retelling in the anime. Why? It doesn't help matters that there's a lot of awkward jump cuts and just... I don't know, the first episode does not leave a good impression. And it really annoys me too. Because when I constantly see people shit on the anime, the anime did it itself. And this episode was the Kickstarter goal, or crowdfunding goal. This side story was never going to be adapted. So if that's the case, this should have probably aired at the end of the anime as a little bonus OVA in my opinion. Moving on from that though, we begin episode 2 proper. Which starts with Ren and Shiro's fight on top of the school where they're beating the hell out of each other as stated earlier. So, they weren't going to adapt the earlier episode, meaning the anime was just going to pick up after the prologue. I have so many questions. Did anyone not think this was a bad idea? The only thing I could consider is that the prologue was going to be originally adapted until they met that fundraising goal, and then they said, oh, well shit, we'll just put in part of uh, the first episode's side story retelling. It fits right in. <sighs> Either way, the anime is 17 episodes, or 18 episodes if you include that bonus thing. And you might think maybe that means it won't suffer from being too short and condensing a lot. Unfortunately, no. You see, the anime suffers from this worse than you'd think. As stated earlier, there's a particular heroin root order you're supposed to take when playing this game. The heroines are Kasumi, Kei, Marie, and Rea. The anime adapts the Marie root. So, it starts from the third root. The reason you're supposed to do this order in the first place is because stuff that happens in Kasumi and Kei's root that you find out is referenced in Marie and Rea's root, and vice versa. For example, Rhea's root is the conclusion of everything, and everything you've learned up to that point from the earlier roots is used here, and, you know, concluded. <sighs> okay, so we started from the third root, and this VN is... Well, my Steam counter says it's 140 hours for me. Oh, God, we condensed 140 hours in 18 episodes, didn't we? Okay. Alright. So, in short, the anime, without going into any more spoilers, is heavily abridged. Fight scenes are heavily cut down. Ren's training is almost completely omitted when he gets his powers. And it only covers one heroin route. I don't understand what happened here. Again, if they used all of that yin to actually adapt more episodes and more roots, this probably could have worked better. Not to mention, it's a bastardized, abridged version of the one root they're adapting. They didn't even adapt this one root properly. And it's not like this stuff hasn't been done before. Fate Stay Night Unlimited Blade Works from Ufotable came out before this even aired, showing that it can be done. Steins Gate came out several years before this. You might say it's not fair to compare them, but I honestly think it is. They should have taken a hard look at the competition of VN adaptations and said, well shit, we might have to extend this to a full 26 eps at the very least in order to do this justice. Well, how's the animation at least? Let's go to that category. Well, from what everyone says, it's pretty damn good. In fact, people theorized that that's where all the yin went, was the animation quality and production value. Too bad there's still a hell of a lot of awkward jump cuts where characters will say, let's go here, and then they automatically appear there oh, a second later. The jump cuts and awkward sideways are probably the least of this show's problems, though. But hey, at least the animation's nice. We get another bright spot, though. Let's move on to the soundtrack. All right, I'm not going to front here. DAZ Ray soundtrack, as of this day, is my favorite anime soundtrack of all time. Holy shit, I'm not joking. 
And one could say it's because it's a games OST, they just took all of it and rearranged it in higher quality instrumentality and production value. But I don't care, this anime OST is fucking brilliant. In fact, I would love for a way to use this OST while playing the Viet. Pieces like Ein Her Yard Rubedo and Rosen Vamp in particular are easily in some of my favorite. And hey, the opening is done by Yui Sakakiara. She's the one that did the opening for the Vienna as well. So they at least got that right. It proves that the people behind this anime were fans of it. In fact, the anime was even supervised by Takashi Masada, meaning he had some involvement, but I don't think I'm gonna blame him for this. I get the feeling he was out of his element because doing a visual novel is completely different from doing an anime as sure anyone could guess. Hmm. Okay. Let's move on from this to the dubcast from Funimation. And this is something I found quite interesting. So the anime was ADR directed by Tyler Walker, and this would be one of the final things he ADR directed too, which is kind of a fun fact, I guess. Um, I remember reading somewhere online, I don't know if this is true or not, but allegedly they had to get a German voice coach to teach the Nazi um, characters, voice actors, how to do German accents. And if that's true, that's really cool. Because it worked to some results. Again, we'll get into that. So I'm going to break this up into little categories. We're going to do protagonists on the good side first, antagonists second. All right. So Ren Fuji is voiced by Brandon McGinnis. And... No... I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not a fan of this. Look, Brandon's an okay voice actor. In fact, I absolutely love his portrayal as Fenrir in Black Clover. It makes Fenrir one of my favorite characters, to be honest, in that show. He's hilarious. And Brandon is also okay as the main in SSSS Gridman, even though that character is bland as shit. The point I'm getting at here is, Brandon just doesn't work as Ren. You see, Ren is, again, on the cusp of trying to find out what he wants to do with his life. As the future is moving forward, he's struggling to find himself. And then this shit happens with the Nazi demons, and he has to learn to rise up and fight for what he loves and believes in. Brandon does not do a good job here in one regard. When the Nazi demons show up and Ren's life goes to hell, Ren falls apart and becomes, you know, his spirit's broken, right? Like, he's he's a mess. Brandon, though, comes across more like a whiny bitch rather than an actual someone who's just distraught. If that's what they were going for, fair enough, but I don't know. Again, no slight against Brandon McGinnis. I, I told you, I think he's a fine VA. I just don't think he's a good Ren Fuji. Personally, I think Rico, Rico Fujardo would have done a better job as Ren. Whenever I play a visual novel, I actually imagine an English dub voice actor in the role of the character that, you know, reading for. So for Ren, I always imagined Rico for some reason. I think about it. I think I did that with Love of Alternative 2. Never mind. Anyway, let's move on. So next we have Kasumi. Ren's childhood friend, who is the tsundere and comedic relief of the group, voiced by Madeline Morris. Now, I might have had my misgivings about Brandon McGinnis over here with Ren, but Madeline Morris is perfect as Kasumi. That is actually exactly who I imagined as Kasumi when playing the VN, so... Yes, I, I completely agree with this one. This is great. Madeline Morris is also known for voicing Sophie and Garo Vanishing Line, which is another fan favorite um, of people online. You know, the anime fandom. As well as voicing the main in the anime Hyoka. She's done a lot of other roles as well. But I think she was great as Kasumi. The problem is, is because this doesn't adapt the Kasumi route. Kasumi kind of fucks off partway in. So she doesn't get much time to shine here. It's a real shame, but oh well. Next, we have Murdy, 
the one whose root that this anime is adapting, voiced by Jade Saxton. Yes, again, perfect casting. It should be noted also that Marie is French, and Jade actually does do an okay French accent, in my opinion. Now, I could be horribly wrong and piss off a lot of people in saying that, but again, it's my opinion. I, I think she did okay. So, yeah, props to her. Jade Saxton, we've covered here before. She's Koniko from DXD, um, Carla from Fairy Tale, etc. Next, we have Rhea, voiced by Trina Nishimura, or Kuri Sue from Steins Gate. And it's okay. She's alright. Again, Rhea is the troll character, and I guess the other kind of Sundare. You could, you know, there's two types. Kasumi being the violent kind, Rhea being the other kind, and yeah, it's, I don't know. Personally, I think she should have been swapped around with the next character, Kei Sakurai, voiced by Brittany Lada, or Ichigo from Darling in the Franks for all of you people out there. Kei is, again, another character that, uh, you see in the VN, she's um, I guess kind of got a more deeper voice, but it's not to the point Brittany Lana went to. I think Brittany Lana made her voice way too deep for this character. I don't know. That's just my opinion. I think that she should have swapped around with Trina, because I think Trina's Mikasa portrayal from Attack on Titan would have gone great with Kay here. And then Brittany Lana, honestly, some of her more higher pitched voices probably would have worked with Rhea. So again though, for what it is, I guess it's okay. I can't complain too much. Next we have Shiro, voiced by Austin Tendall. Yes, 100 percent yes. He's literally doing a, a lot of accelerator from the A Certain franchise here, and it works perfectly. You can tell Austin is having a lot of fun as this role. Holy shit, dude. Shiro is great, and he's another fan favorite of a lot of people, and he's one of my favorite in this visual novel, too. And the anime at least does give him a few moments to shine. Next, we have Shiro's girlfriend, Ellie, not Aerie. <sighs> Damn it, Funimation. Ellie, voiced by Elizabeth Maxwell, or Sainijima from Persona 5, Bishimon from Noragami. And again, another great casting choice. I think she did a great job here. But that's the protagonist out of the way. Let's go to the antagonist side. And there's a lot of them. So first, we have Trifa, voiced by Ian Sinclair. No. I'm just going to be blunt there. No. Look, Ian is a fine voice actor, but his accent for this character is one of the weaker ones. You can tell that there's a lot of lines where he loses the accent completely, and... I wouldn't be surprised if he saw the hype this anime was getting, because remember, when this anime came out, it was based on a decently popular VN for the time. And he probably wanted this show under his resume, seeing the hype on the wall. But... It just doesn't work. Not to mention, Trifa's voice is deeper than the one Ian does in this show. I know people are going to be like, you fucking weep, why are you mad? Guys, I gotta understand, alright? Played the entire VN, plus read its prequel visual novel, Interview with Kaze Klube. So, these Japanese voices are burned into my psyche. So, gonna have to compare here on this one. Ian's not awful, but... Uh, I'm just not a fan of it here. Next, we have Lisa, not Riza. Funimation. You did the same shit in Steins Gate with Luca, changing their name to Ruka. <sighs> anyway, Lisa is voiced by Caitlin Glass, or Winry from Fullmetal Alchemist, and we've covered her before as Kyoko from Skip Beat as well, and Danganronpa. She's played two Kyokos. And she does okay here. I'd put her somewhere in the middle as far as um, accents go. She's... She's all right. So, move on from her to Rusaka Shinagarin, 
voiced by Jimmy Toronto or Android 21 from Dragon Ball Fighters, probably the most recognizable thing to a lot of the casuals out there. It's cool. It's cool. And I think she did a good job here. The problem is a lot of Rusalka's best moments aren't in this route. So she doesn't get to do that much. You're going to be hearing me say that a lot when we get to the spoiler section. So, For which she got, it, it was, I guess, okay. Could have been a lot worse, but oh well. Next, we have my absolute favorite character in this entire franchise, Wilhelm Ehrenberg. Voiced by Aaron Roberts, who is quickly becoming one of my favorite up-and-coming voice actors. He voices Klaus in Black Clover. He voiced in Ash to Lost in Space last year. Aaron Roberts, I feel, is a very, very talented voice actor. But how does he match up with my friend Wilhelm here? This is one of the few Japanese voice actors I do know by name. Wilhelm in the game is voiced by Kisho Taniyama, who is been in a lot of shit. The guy has been in Jojo, Show by Rock. Actually, Show by Rock, he played Crow. Kind of funny imagining Wilhelm calling his fans cattle. No, actually, that makes sense. Never mind. The point is, is, yeah, he's one of the few Japanese VAs I do know. For good reason. So, does Aaron Roberts actually do a good job as Wilhelm, though? Is the ultimate question here? Yes. Definitely. The problem is, again, well, um, a lot of this shit gets cut, and I don't understand why he's literally one of the most popular characters. How could you shaft one of the most popular members of the LDO? Moving on from him, we have Rote Spinne, voiced by Marcus Stimak. Or Tarasica from Assassination Classroom. He's also been in a bunch of other stuff. And I gotta be honest, his accent is also decent. Spinny is basically the grunt of the LDO. And it, yeah. He gets hardly any screen time, whether in the game or in the anime. He's the bitch of the group. But what little is given here, he did okay. Next, we have Beatrice. A character who's only in episode zero, or the prequel OVA, whatever you want to call it. So it makes you wonder, what was the point of including them in the anime, other than to make the fans go, I know who that is, because newcomers are going to think, what the hell happened to this chick? She's voiced by Alexis Tipton, and she did an excellent job here. It's kind of sad that this character completely got dropped, because it makes you think, well, what could have been, right? Moving on from her, we have Tubal Cain, who does not have a dubbed VA. Tubal Cain is just a monster that grunts, but I kind of surprises me Funimation didn't even bother to give him a dub voice actor. I don't know. Normally they do that sort of thing. I guess they thought it wasn't necessary. Not like this character is barely here in this anime adaptation to begin with, so we can skip him. Next, we're moving on to the Einher Yard, or Hydric's top three officers of the LDO. First, we have Eleanor von Wittenberg, voiced by Alex Moore. And no, I'm sorry, just no. Look, Alex Moore is a decent voice actress. She plays Nozomi in A Centaur's Life, as well as several other shows too. The problem here is her accent and voice don't fit here for Eleanor. If you want me to give you a quick description of Eleanor, I guess the best way to describe it is Nazi Urza from Fairy Tale. Granted, her views are incredibly extreme, but the way her values work seems very similar to Urza, and that's the vibe I got from her. In fact, in the game, I feel like close match to her Japanese voice actress would have actually been Colleen Clinkenbeard doing the Urza voice. Alex Moore does a fantastic job. In fact, her accent's almost too good. There were people online saying they could barely understand what this character was saying, so... I think she would have done better if she were someone else, but not Eleanor. Next, we have the second member of the Einhard Yar, Machina. 
And this one is uncredited. Trust me, I've looked. I went to his wikia. I went to the IMDb. I went to behind the voice actors. Um, the a dub cast announcement. Everything. He is the one person I couldn't find shit on. So, I'm going to have to take a stab in the dark here and guess of who he was voiced by. Which I'm pretty sure I can tell based on the voice. But if I'm wrong, you people have free reign to laugh at me in the comments section. I believe he is voiced by Tyson Reinhardt, who we have covered here before as Hifumi from Danganronpa, as well as in Steins Gate and everything else. It should be noted he was the scriptwriter for DAZ Ray, and it wouldn't surprise me if they did reuse him. The save on time, money, etc., because he's right there already. So, I will have to say though, I, if I thought Ian had one of the worst accents out of the group, Nope, that honor goes to you, my friend Machina, because holy shit, your accent barely exists. <sighs> you got dirt done dirty, Machina. You genuinely did. I don't know who did his accent. If I'm right, then he, he did a bad job as him. Which, again, no slight to him. He's a decent voice actor. I mean, he's great as the man in Kimono Michi. But, hey, if I'm wrong, oh well. Shit happens. Either way... I did not like Machina in the dub. Next, we have Wolfgang Schreiber, voiced by Michaela Krantz. Yes, a million times, yes. Perfect casting. Schreiber, for those who don't know, is fucking psychotic, completely insane, and Michaela Krantz owns it perfectly. Holy shit. She's also been Momiji and Fruits Baskets 2019 iteration, and you can tell because she used what she learned here in Diazire, you know, i.e. the German accent, and applied it to that as well. And she was the character Ellie in After School Dice Club, where again, she used the German accent. So, in a sense, she could, I guess, thank this role for that. But, man, if the first two members of the Einhard ER were misses for me, this one was a complete home run. Definitely. Like, she's, she's probably MVP of the dub. Even though Schreiber doesn't get much screen time, every scene he's in with her, she owns it. But I'll save that for spoilers. Next, we have Karl Kraft, the second in command of the LDO and the sorcerer of the group. Voiced by Brandon McGinnis. Again, double casting... Actually, this time, there's a good reason. It's due to redacted plot significance, because even in the Japanese, it's the same VA as well. I'm not going to go into that reasoning. But I will say, Brandon does a much better job here as Carl Croft than he does as Ren. His accent's on point. He does a good job of making him sound mysterious and very wise and just, yeah, he does good as him. So, I don't like his Ren. I like his Carl Croft. Next, we have Reinhard Hydridic himself, voiced by Dave Trosco, who's Ghosh from Black Clover, and who's also been in a lot of other shit, too. And, yes, again, another good casting, in my opinion. He does a good job of making Hydric sound both intimidating while also sounding like a decent leader. Like, you can tell people will follow this man into hell if he ordered it. So, that's basically everyone on the dub cast list that I could talk about at the moment. But I could also cover some of the other finer notes, how in Marie's backstory, they gave everyone that she was around French accents as well. And most of them were okay, I guess. Bit or miss. It should also be noted that the singing, what little there is in this anime, is dubbed. And that's a nice touch. I always applaud dubbed singing. However, there's a scene where they go into the nightclub, and the Walla is not dubbed. I don't know why. At first I thought it was the simuldub version, but no, it's the same on the Blu-ray as well. I don't get this. I, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe they thought they didn't need to, but it is distracting <laughs> if, you, if you pick up on it. Ugh. So... In conclusion, with Diazira's English dub, um, it's okay. I don't hate it. I, I 
the dub is all right, but like the, the MVPs are clearly going to be Austin Tendel as Shiro and <sighs> Michaela Kranz as Schreiber. I should also point out that for some reason in the first few episodes, Carl Croft or Brandon McGinnis keeps calling Hydric Hydrich, which every other character calls him Hydric, so I don't know what the hell that was about. Um, now, I guess that about covers everything with the dub. As far as in conclusion with everything with the anime, again, it's an abridged mess. I highly recommend staying away from this and just playing the VN on Steam, which I hope I've convinced at least some of you to check this out, because this VN is amazing. It's incredibly long, I agree, but again, Fate Stay Night is long, and Love Love Alternative is long. Hell, most of the great VNs are long, so wouldn't hold that against it if I were you. Before going into spoilers, I will just give a lot of problems with this anime real quick as to why it's not good, besides the heavy abridging starting halfway through the game and everything else. Because the anime is starting on the Marie route, which, let me be fair, I understand why they did this. You see, the Marie route was originally conceived as being the potential true end route before they came up with the Reyes scenario to wrap things up even farther and give some of the characters with less screen time more time to shine. So I get what they were doing. The problem is it just doesn't work here because it means half the anime's dialogue is exposition dumps, and that's not a good way to tell your story. When the fight starts, because of the badass music and the animation quality and everything, you could probably get into it and be entertained. But as far as the story, it's a confusing mess in the anime and doesn't make any sense. I mean, they even throw out the term Zarathustra in one of Ren's backstory or flashbacks. And the, you might be wondering, what the hell does that mean? The anime doesn't explain it. Again, the games, it makes sense when you see this. But in the anime, nope. It's said once, never mentioned again. <sighs> so between that, the fights being heavily abridged too, like Wilhelm's fights in particular definitely get shafted and again, being my favorite character really pissed me off. So, yeah. <laughs> Stay away from this anime. But at the very least, check out the soundtrack. The soundtrack is fucking awesome. I would say only watch this anime if you've already played through the game and watch it in dub. The accents for a lot of these voice actors really give it a nice touch. Oh, and by the way, I should mention, um, before anyone brings up the characters speaking Japanese, even though they're Germans, it's explained in, I believe, K's route in the VN, that whatever country the LDO members happen to be in, they are easily able to adopt that language due to magical reasons, so... There's context given. That being said, though, you have free reign to bitch about it, I guess, and um, whenever they're in Berlin in the prologue, because that doesn't make any damn sense, and I agree with you 100%. Free reign, like, yes, you need my permission to bit. No, of course not. Nah, but in all seriousness, um, yeah. Like I said, stay away from the anime. And as much as I want to grade this... <sighs> This is where things get really complicated for me, and why I was hesitant to cover this in the first place. I can't hate this anime or grade it, simply because there's too much bias involved. This anime is what got me interested in DZ Ray in the first place. Yeah, I was one of the few people who watched the anime, was curious enough to look into the source material, and glad I did. I saw some people saying the same thing, that they were lost, and wanted to look up the VN. Ultimately, though, what won me over was the soundtrack. Hearing the soundtrack in the anime, I, again, words can't express how much I love the soundtrack. So, we're going into spoilers, I guess, but 
yeah, when it comes to Dia Zire, just please, if you have the ability to, check out the VN. It's a great visual novel, and I don't think you'll be disappointed. Lastly, before spoilers, for realsies this time, I guess I should go into what happened to the people involved with this anime. So, Studio Light would come out in February of 2019. Oh, February 2019. During the drama of all that bullshit from last year in the W community. Cool. Well, they came out and announced Interview with Kaze Kube, which is the game that follows Wilhelm, by the way, so I, naturally I was hyped, would be getting an English release, as well as the Vita port of DAZ Ray would finally be finished and released. That it was already completed, they just needed to talk to America and Europe about releasing it. So, things were looking up for the series. Until April 1st, my friend Manslayer Goku messaged me this article that Light's parent company went bankrupt. Thus, Light went out of business along with them. I thought it was a joke. I really did. I thought he was fucking me. But no, he wasn't. He was not screwing with me. Yeah, he was fucking me. No, I thought he was fucking with me. He's not. It's... It was true. My favorite visual novel. The company that made it went under. Sucks, man. Sucks. To this day, I don't know what's going on with them. Apparently, Light were given funding to complete one more game. And that came out a couple months ago. But since then, there's been nothing. And... As a fan of DAZ Ray, I feel really sad about this. Again, it did have a sequel game, Kajidi Kamui Kagura, that will most likely never be translated now. Well, I guess there's Google Translate. Oh, that could be disastrous. I'm going to try that one day. I just want to see how bad it'll be. But alright, guys. Thank you all so much for watching. Spoiler time. Okay, so... About the anime, and what was cut specifically that I hated... Uh, where do I even begin? There's already the stupid amount of shit cut in the side story that they adapted at the beginning. But, let's move on from there. Alright. So... The anime... Calls the... the um, it constantly drops the term glad shame. I feel like I should start with that because it's what the anime opens with, a shot of Gladshane. It doesn't explain that's the castle they reside in. I don't know why this is under spoilers, but fuck it. So, for those that don't know, yes, that's why they say Gladshane and refer to it as that. that that's that's the castle. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, I should also mention that my favorite line from Rhea is not in the dub. I don't know if that's in the sub or not. I don't know. Someone could tell me. It's from the game. She says to Ren when she asks him for his coat. She says, hey, I'm cold. Can you give me your coat? And he goes, nope, I'm cold too. And she goes, give it over, bitch. And says it in her calm tone like she always does. It's hilarious. And the anime kind of drops this. And I don't know. It makes me sad. Um... Let's move on to episode four, though, where um, Ren is being trained with his powers, which, by the way, the anime handles the awakening of those poorly, too. They're like, heavily rushed and condensed. But to train him, Kei Sakurai, who, by the way, is on their side for the time being in the beginning, um, holds his hand and is shooting it with a gun telling him that even though he has powers now, eventually his hand will be shot off after a while, and it will hurt unless he awakens his innate ability, forcing him to actually draw it out and not mess around. Well, cut from the anime. Screw that. She just tells him how the powers work, and he instantly masters them. Cool story, bro. <sighs> Fuck this anime. It's putting points, man. Speaking of which, Ren's first fight is against Spine, which I guess you could say was his way of waking up to his powers fully and understanding how they work. Turning Marie into the weapon that he uses. Yeah, see, so solely to reference. So, this fight with Spine, heavily condensed, I, I don't like that, I really don't, no. This, this is supposed to be Ren's awakening, I guess. I guess the next thing I'll bitch about, as it were, 
is K Sakurai versus Ren in Wilhelm's first fight against Shiro. Um, it's in episode six, I believe. You see, you might be wondering, how the hell does Shiro stand up against the Nazi demons? Well, in the game, it's explained that he drinks adrenaline and, you know, takes shots of that and everything. So his body's acting on hyper-awareness and everything. But in the anime, it skips that scene. So you're just meant to assume, oh, well, shit, I guess he's a badass for no reason. Which, I mean, I, I, I guess Shiro is pretty badass. So I'm not gonna ask. Either way, though, the fights between these or whatever are heavily condensed here. <sighs> so, moving on from that, we get a little bit of K's past, where they adapt another side story harshly. <sighs> I'm gonna have to try pronouncing this. Alright. I believe it's called Demorgendum Morde? Something like that. Anyway, it's a side story you unlock for beating K's root. I, I probably got some of these side stories off, but the point is, in it, you find out why K joined the LDO, and the anime shows a couple of flashbacks to it, but nothing concrete enough to give you a real reason. I guess I should mention her brother Kai is voiced by Josh Grell, or Greeley, so it's kind of cool, I guess. I don't know. Either way, again, just poorly throwing in elements that don't need to be here if you're not going to do anything with it. Next, we have Wilhelm and Shiro's final battle in the Marie route at the church. One of my favorite fights from the VN, and it's heavily cut down and condensed. And... Mm, dude, things about this enemy pissed me off so much. It should also be mentioned, Wilhelm's sister, who resides inside him, because Wilhelm's a fucking weirdo and a freak, um, is here, voiced by Sarah Wiedenheft. So, I'd say she actually had a decent accent for all three lines she got to say as Helga, Wilhelm's sister. But, yeah. It's at this point, though, during the anime, you realize the Bankais, as I like to call them, or the Breas, which are basically the full manifestation of one's own powers. So, for example, Wilhelm, because he's a vampire, has the ability to make an eternal night. So, it sucks the blood and essence out of anything around him within a 500 meter radius, and he is in complete control of this domain. And even during the day, he can activate it, creating perpetual night within that 500 meter radius around him. Well, the characters have to do chants in Latin, and it makes it feel really epic when these are released. Like, oh, you do not want to fuck around now. Like, this is the serious time. The fight's getting real. In the anime, it just... Yeah. It's heavily cut down. In fact, half the characters don't even get to use their breas, or even do their chants. They just activate them. One of them, I think, being Rasalka, she got really shafted in this anime. <laughs> now, I guess one of the next things to bitch about is they were trying here, and I could tell they were, because they were trying to adapt stuff from other routes as well. For example, Kasumi's route reveals Trifa's past. Trifa had run away from the LDO and abandoned it, but was tracked down by Hydric, and brought back, and Hydric punished him for it severely by forcing Trifa to pick ten people he was watching over at um, the place he was at, and having him watch them get killed. Yeah, Hydric's kind of a dick. But in all seriousness, this you find out in Kasumi's route. They kind of shoehorned it in here into the Marie route, which proves that they were trying. They were genuinely trying to combine all the routes into one anime. It gets even more apparent when, during the final battle, where everyone has to fight each other, right? The Einherdiar versus K, Ren, and Shiro. K has to fight Eleanor. During this fight, Eleanor has a flashback to her fight with Beatrice. Here's the problem. That fight happened during K's route. 
so in the anime context, it doesn't matter. It didn't happen. So people are going to be confused. It's cool for fans of the game, or because we're like, oh, wow, it's a nice touch. But for new fans, it's it just doesn't work. I should mention that the final six episodes, or the OVAs, did receive better results, I guess, in the critics' side of things, and from fans. Probably because, I guess, they were slightly paced better. I don't even know if I'd go that far, though. It was only the last three episodes where they tried doing the pacing properly with the final battle. So, I guess let's talk about that real quick. So, K versus Eleanor, that fight is slightly condensed. Again, though, they, they just caught the finer points of it. It's not condensed to the point of it being bastardized. Then you have Shiro versus Schreiber. This fight is easily the highlight. Again, Austin Tendo and Michaela Krantz's performance in this fight was fucking legendary and easily the best dub scene. Everyone I've talked to who's seen the dub seems to agree with that sentiment. So I'm not alone in that fact, I guess. Or maybe I am alone. Maybe I'm always alone. But I guess that's the highlight here. Shiro and Schreiber's fight. And... When Shiro calls Ellie out to help him, again, it's it's fun. It's just a fun watch. Then you have Ren versus Machina. And uh, this fight is one that doesn't work. You see Machina is constantly referring to Ren as his comrade from a past life. And Ren's having flashbacks of it. But it's not explained very well in the anime. This is stuff you find out primarily in the Rea route to give the game more finality and to show everything and give Machina more closure because he was the one member of the Einher Yard that didn't have 100% attention, at least as of that point. So, it being thrust here in the Marie route just feels tacked on and pointless. I mean, Machina could have literally been anyone as far as a new viewer is concerned. So, yeah. It should be mentioned here that Isaac, who is Hydric's, I guess, bastard child, who is the one who controls Gladshane, the castle, is voiced by Amberly Connors. That's cool, I guess. Again, her, what line, few lines she got were okay. Notice she was trying to do an accent. That was okay, I guess. But again, this character is a very minor character in the anime in the grand scheme of things. They try playing it up like it was important that Isaac do something in the final couple of episodes. But it's just... No. It didn't really feel earned with that. I'm trying to be as vague as possible here because I do want people to still play this VN and I know there's some people that still stick around with spoilers. So That being said though, um... Yeah, the final episode, let's touch on that. The first 10 minutes of it are the fight between Hydradic and Ren, wrapping up everything, with Carl Croft watching. You see, Carl Croft, his motivation is he was, he's already a deity, but he wants to see who he can crown as the next deity, right? That's his whole thing. Thus, whoever wins between Ren and Hydradic, he would crown. At least that was the plan. But what I'm getting at here is Carl Croft doesn't do much in the anime for this reason because we only cover the Marie route. So during the final battle, he just kind of fucks off and says, all right, you two wrap this up and finish this. I'm going home. I'm out, yo. And that's it. He's gone from the anime. In the game, post everything, he has a conversation with Ren about the events that happened and if everything that, that happened left them satisfied. So it at least gives a little more finality to it in the Marie route. Speaking of the Marie route, upon completing it, you unlock another side story, the epilogue for Marie, which the anime tries cramming in the final five minutes of this extra side story in 
to its final episode. Side story being Omni Vincent Amore, I think. I, I don't know, I probably butchered that. Someone's gonna hurt me for this eventually, I'm sure. The story is basically showing years and years and years in the future where everyone was reincarnated as a better person. The Nazi demons are now normal people without their powers and everyday workers of society, as you do. And Ren and Marie are able to meet up again because, you know, that Marie was reincarnated. Ren never aged because of his powers. It's, again, it's a cool little epilogue in the game. In the anime, it just feels like, how much are we cramming in this last episode, dude? This should have really been a final OVA. You guys had an additional 60 plus million yen from your Kickstarter goal, or whatever site it was raised on. You couldn't do one more additional episode? Really? That being said, though... <sighs> I don't know. I don't hate this anime. As a fan of it, I can still watch it and get enjoyment out of it. There are some fights that I would have loved to have seen animated, though, or adapted. And maybe that'll happen someday. I mean, Wilhelm and Shriver's rivalry is completely omitted from the anime. <laughs> and why? They have a fucking amazing fight at, um, near the end of the final route of the VN, and it's great. Easily one of the highlights. And it's one of the things where Wilhelm and Schreiber hate each other, yet in the anime you get none of that. Even though, well, Schreiber does kind of knock off Wilhelm, I guess, in the Marie route which makes sense in the context of the VN. The anime, it just seems like an action of randomness. Some of the other fights I wouldn't mind seeing is Wilhelm versus Kay from Kay's Root, Beatrice versus Eleanor from Kay's Root that they tried cramming in elements of, I guess. Ren, Kay, and Shiro versus Shriver. That's another good one. In fact, now that I think about it, Ren versus Shiro's um, final battle where they fight on top of the school again at the end of Rea's route. That fight's fucking brutal. That would have been cool to see. And the final fight of Ren versus Carl Croft versus Hydric, a three-way battle to see who will become the next deity at the center of the universe where everything is being destroyed. That fight would be kick-ass if animated right. Come on. Not to mention... <sighs> Rusalka and Kane were the other two that got shafted. I think their fights could have been included to show off what they could do more. Kane was a very nothing character in this anime. But what can you do, right? Anyway, I hope I made my case as to why I think this anime is not a very good adaptation. As a fan of the games, I can strongly say stay away from it. Look up the soundtrack if you want, but if you ever have an interest in checking out the visual novel genre, DSZ Ray is not a bad place to start. It takes a little while to get going, trust me on that. Again, after the prologue, it slows down to show you Ren's everyday life before it slowly gets ripped away from him. Much like Love Love. Huh. Maybe there's a way to compare the two of those at some point. Anyway. But, trust me, if you follow the Root Order Guide, which, yeah, you I know, but you have to do it with Fate Stay Night too. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Um, <laughs> you'll, you'll be well rewarded, I feel, with a great story. I absolutely love DAZ Ray. In fact, it's one of the reasons I bought the anime on Blu-ray, despite its flaws. Because I just love DAZ Ray to the extent where I'll support it. Even the shittiness aspect of it, right? So that's what it means to be a fan. Accept the bad with the good. So I'd say this was a dubster worth diving into. But we do have one more thing to point out. Why is the audio on the Blu-ray so damn quiet? Anyone else who owns the Blu-ray, please tell me if that's true or not. Because, yeah. Um, I watched this on Crunchyroll, Hulu, and compared it to the Blu-ray, the Crunchyroll and Hulu version's audios are fine. The Blu-ray audio, though, is kind of fucked. I don't know why. It comes in so quiet. You have to turn it up all the way to hear it. And it's the only Blu-ray like that. 
At least that I've seen. I don't know. Probably others. Yeah, it's the only one in the whole world. Big matter of fact. But no. Um, so leave a comment below, though. Let me know what you thought of the Azirati animation. Maybe you loved the hell out of it way more than I did. Hell, maybe you hated the shit out of it and think it's a scourge to humanity or something. I don't know. Let me know what you think. Um, and for those of you that have played the visual novel, let me know what you thought of that as well. Hey, maybe we can have a discussion of who best waifu is in the VN. <laughs> I don't know. I should also mention that Dubster Dive has been fun thus far, but I consider this to be a sort of season finale of sorts. 24 episodes has been cool. And no, this doesn't mean Dubster Dive is done. Trust me on that. Just means. I feel like this is a great place to leave Season 1. Dove Survive will definitely be back. So don't be afraid to leave a suggestion and let me know an anime you'd like us to talk about at some point. Perhaps we will. Who knows? I don't know. Yes, Goku. I agree with you. Tacos indeed. I just saw that. <laughs> anyway, um... Yeah, so thank you all so much for watching, and... Thank you all so much for enjoying Dubster Dive to this point. I know some of you have actually really liked it from what I've seen, and that's that's really cool. Again, these unscripted discussion vids of anime. I absolutely love anime, the good and the bad, and I, I really enjoyed this. This was fun. All of them I've covered so far here have been great. We start with Saint Seiya, which me and Goku had to redo. That was, that was cool, I guess. Covered Campione, he's Kai Cheat Magician. Covered the Minyana March. That was fun. That was fun. Kikaishi got to watch that again. And yeah, overall it's just episode I've been a lot of fun. So don't worry. Probably just taking a little bit of a break from it, but it will definitely be back. Um Like I said, love anime. Except Yogamesh. That anime can burn in a fire. <laughs> but um yeah. So, despite all the shit that happened last year, that's why I still support English dubs. Not just because I've got terrible vision and all that, but because, you know, English dubs need to happen, I feel, for it to reach the most people it can and all that good stuff. Not trying to be all preachy here and get all rambly. It's just, yeah. Anyways, thank you all again so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. I can't say that enough. And I hope you all have yourselves a great day. And until next time, guys. Thank you all again. I'll see you later.